I want to start with a young man. He was 18 years old and he was a chemistry student. And as so often it happens, as also to me when I studied chemistry, reactions just don't work. He was supposed, he was supposed to do a chemical reaction that produces an agent against malaria. And it didn't work. So when you do a reaction that doesn't work, what happens? You end up with a sludge in a beaker. Are there any chemists in the auditorium? Ah. <laughs> so, and what do you do? You can't even get it out. So basically, you don't use detergents to clean the beaker, but you use, for instance, acetone or ethanol. And that's what he did. He used alcohol to get the sludge out of the beaker. And then he discovered something. Basically, the color that comes when he used alcohol in it was very nice and purple. And as it so often happens, chemists do weird things with the stuff they produce, even they don't know what it is. He tried to dye silk and wool, and it worked really nice, because I have to admit, silk and wool are pretty easy to dye. So he showed it to his friends, and also to his brother, and they decided to start a company, and also to patent this color. So for startups, Basically, that's what you do. You secure your IP. The second thing what he did, he sent off samples of silk and his wool to, to clients, to possible clients. So this is the second thing that you do, you secure your sales funnel. And the, the clients were pretty excited. So what is the next thing a startup has to do? Yeah, you're right. They have to get an investor. And he found a good investor, Papa. And together, at this age, they build up a factory making dyes, especially this one dye, but many others followed. And maybe you have guessed already who this person was, Sir William Henry Perkin later. And the year was 1856. And the color that he found was mauveim, or mauve, as he calls it. And what happens is that this color basically was the start of synthetic chemistry and all synthesis colors. Many like him at this time experimented to create synthetic colors. A whole industry rose from this. And also that's why so many chemistry students have to really learn for the chemistry exams in organic chemistry because there's so many reactions they have to learn. But then, a bit later, as it happens, he was not the only one, like that was 18, in, the, in the early 1870s, he wasn't the only one who was producing this. Until then, he was globally the only one supplying this color. So he was really a unicorn. And then the Germans started to do it, and then, what did he do? He sold this company. So that's the exit strategy, what you call with startups. He went back to university. And nowadays, we have a world full of colors. It's in our food, it's in our cosmetics, it's on our clothes, it's everywhere. And probably because when you're sitting here today, the things that you're wearing, you chose because, maybe because of the color. And that's also because I chose to study chemistry. And human mankind has known colors for quite some time, like prehistoric times. They used minerals, they used plants, and they used animals to produce color. But what are colors? As a chemist, and as my chemistry teacher in high school always told me, everything is chemistry. <laughs> you wouldn't be able to tell which of these compounds is natural or which is synthetic. All of them are colors. Another purple. This is Tyrium purple. And this is actually made from the snail that you just saw before. And this snail has gland, and you extract it basically from the gland of this snail. And when Caesar was wearing his silk toga, probably around 10,000 of these snails had to be either milked or slaughtered. So this color was one of the most expensive available at the time. What happened, coming back to Perkin, was that when he invented or he found the synthetic colors, 
actually it made it colors available for everybody because for instance Turian blue was only available to kings and the high place clergy. Let's go back to the startup. What happens when you have a new product and, and nobody knows about this product and how they work? What happens is basically that sometimes there are very detrimental effects from a product you didn't anticipate. At the time when this was happening, people didn't know about the environment or much about cancer. And they were exposed to high, high portions of synthetic dyes. Basically, that all of these, uh, a lot of these uh, workers actually got sick from the work. And even nowadays, even working conditions in some parts of the, country, uh, of the world have been improved, but there are a lot that still suffer. There's, for instance, increased cancer rate in textile workers. They also estimate in Germany one, more than 1.2% of all allergic diseases are caused by the dyes that we're wearing. So even so, governments started to ban individual dyes since, since quite some time. This is still not enough. Sometimes blue water is just not nice. Textile companies and dye houses are just putting unfiltered water into the rivers and lakes. And they, can, they are toxic immediately, and also the chemicals that accompany the dyeing process. What happens, they can immediately kill the wildlife, but also they can have long-term effects, like over-fertilizing the, the water bodies. That means that there's eutrophication happening, that the water is out of balance, not enough oxygen in the water for the fish to breathe. And if the temperature is rising, they're all suffocating. These are pictures from China. And even that, on top of it, that could induce heightened algae growth and everything under this algae is dead. The textile industry by now is the second largest polluter worldwide from the industries. That means more than 20% of the fresh water is polluted by the dyeing process. Maybe it's time for something new, something completely different. I don't know if you know much about Austrian musicians. This is a famous Austrian artist and singer, and he was also made by a famous Austrian painter. But actually, this picture is not painted. It has been grown. The painter, Erich Schopf, he put inoculated the paper with bacteria, and over time, they would grow on the paper and eventually develop color. And then, after some time, he stopped the growth, and then this picture came out. We received from our artists, our, one of our team members, and our team member is called Bacterium Lividum, and it's a bacterium that you can find in soil and water, and it's quite hard. It also can be found in the skin of a salamander. It fights off fungal attacks, and it's also antiviral, and it's antibacterial. And it's also some blue-purplish color. We were really excited when we got the first samples and we saw it growing in the Petri dish. We couldn't believe that something was so intensive. And then, totally not me being a chemist, but not a biochemist, we, we decided to put in textiles. And this is also not biochemical language, so forgive me. This is bacteria crawling over textiles and growing on them. <laughs> so that's what we're doing. We're making also the, the textiles themselves. So, and there was no stopping. We took other bacteria in and tried different colors, different bacteria stems. And it was a really colorful day in the lab. And we're lucky because we are at the University, Vienna University of Technology, and we have the luxury of having a biochem lab next to a chemical lab. Because actually what we're trying to solve is both chemistry and biochemistry. Because to grow bacteria, that's one thing, and also to dye fabrics is another thing. That's chemistry. But we're also not only doing colors, 
We're also trying it on different type of fabrics, like the usual ones. As you know, silk and wool is pretty easy, but we also do cotton and we do, for instance, linen. We do angora. We even have citrus fibers. And somebody brought dog hair into the lab. <laughs> we also noticed that we need a bit of help with this because it's not easy to dye. And these dyes are new, as it was for Perkin. Because Perkin's dye weren't so good at the beginning. They weren't so color fast and wash fast and light fast at the beginning as they should be. So you need quite a bit of development on this to make sure that they stick on the fiber. It is very important because even the fiber and the dye, they're both chemicals and they need to find a bond together. So in Austria, Austria is a very small country, but still, and the textile industry was, was present there at the Industrial Revolution, but it was quite amazing for me to find companies that still work in this field, especially the dye house that we're working with and the designers. And they're specialized on natural dyes made from plants. And they have over 15 years of experience dyeing with these plants and have solved all the questions about lightness, washfastness, and colorfastness. They don't, they don't only produce uh, uh, home textiles, but also beautiful dresses. So it is always a question like, why does the textile industry not use dyes from, from plants? Well, nowadays they have also evolved, even so they have been completely diminished over the years with, with the rise of synthetic dyes. This was really disruptive at the time. And there was no place for natural dyes because everybody wanted the better synthetic ones. But in truth is that synthetic dyes are quite toxic and natural dyes are, I have to say, they're still a little bit toxic but not that much, and that's very important. They still need chemicals to be fixated on, but it's a far better improvement. They're non-cancerogenic and often have medicinal applications. They're biodegradable, which helps the decomposition in the water. And most of all, they also have mild conditions for dying. But should we then use plants all over the place? I don't think so. Because in order to grow these plants, it takes time and it it takes surface. It takes away water from maybe food or other things. And that's why we're presenting here the bacterial dyes. Because you grow them basically overnight in a reactor anywhere in the world, depend, independent of the climate zone and independent of any kind of commodity prices because they feed on organic material. What about the fashion industry? It's like 50% of the textile industry. This is what we're trying to get into, but this is very hard because the rise of the textile industry has already happened. What is there to grow? It's a very highly optimized business. Everything has to be very much to the point. It's not easy. And also for the consumers, this is not easy. You look at the label of your T-shirt and you see nothing. You see maybe what it is made of and how to wash it and how to iron it. Tell anything about the dyes or any other chemicals that have been in touch with these uh, clothes. And you're wearing them every day, 24 seven. So what has to change? Fashion industry is very much into sustainability and they're looking very much into their supply chain, which is subcontractors after subcontractors after subcontractors, even they don't know where their clothes come. But that's not good enough if they just write sustainability reports. I want to know, I'm a chemist. I read every ingredient of the food that I'm eating, even the toothpaste. I don't need microplastics in my toothpaste. We heard today about change. I talk about revolution. Dyes have been banished already. But it's time to banish even more. And this goes out to the governments. There are alternatives. Don't hesitate. And to, and to all the fashion industry and the dye houses, we're not doing this so you can put more dirty water into the rivers. We're doing this so you can clear your water easier. 
We're doing this for your workers because they need to be protected. And we're doing it for us because we don't want to have that on our bodies. And last but not least, consumers, as you all are. You all, we all need to fall in love with fashion in a new way, in a smart way. Because I think that the time for synthetic dyes is over. It's time to rethink the materials that we use on a daily basis. This is not a smart way of doing it. This is not what we should do with petrochemicals. For me as a chemist, most importantly is the question, what are things made of and what should they be made of? Think about that when you have your next shopping trip. Thank you very much. Wow, fascinating stuff. Thank you. <laughs> so if you can make colors out of bacteria, I've got a question for you. Are there other organisms you can make? Yeah, we know of, oh, other, yeah. of other companies that uh, make uh, dyes also from algae and from fungi, but we decided to settle for bacteria. So I assume they might be equally good, but we just like our bacteria. I see. <laughs> and I, I hope you heard saying in Germany there was a, a large number of people getting sick from allergies and mm. catching diseases through, yeah. um, obviously through fabrics and their, their dyes. Yeah. Why is it then, if, uh, if in our food we know exactly what we're eating, or per se, we, um, we, you know, if we're allergic to nuts, we order something, it will say that it's got nuts, so we avoid it, so we actually don't hurt ourselves. Why isn't that, that happening in the industry, yeah. the fashion industry, where they actually say where the dye is coming from, or what it's actually, where the bacteria is made out of? That's actually an excellent question. <laughs> because I wondered that myself. The thing is that it took the food regulations very long to put that through, but it really helps us all. And there's a lot of food allergies that can be like, kept at bay with that. But somehow this didn't reach the textile industry, and I think maybe it's because of the lobby, maybe because it's really so hard with all the subcontracting to figure out, okay, this is a global business, where does that come from? Maybe it's really difficult, but I think as consumers we should really ask for it. Sure. Okay, thank you so okay. much, Karen. Thank you. Round of applause for Karen. <laughs>